Welcome to the podcast from Gateway Baptist Church. You're listening to a message from our Mackenzie campus. Find us at gatewaybaptist.com.au if you'd like to connect with us as we seek to change lives by following Jesus in our community, our nation and our world. Great to be with you this morning. Happy New Year. Is it not too late to say Happy New Year? Is it okay? January, I think through the month of January you can say Happy New Year. And uh, it's great to be with you and sharing with you this morning. We continue our Summer Psalm series. We're kind of choosing some psalms uh, to look at over the month of January. And these were songs that were uh, written for the people of Israel. It's kind of like the hymn book uh, for the people of Israel. If you open up your Bible, it kind of sits right in the middle. 150 songs uh, written uh, in five volumes, kind of five different hymnals compiled together as songs of worship and theology for the people of Israel. And uh, this morning, I want to look at a psalm that comes out of a little section in the fifth hymnal. Uh, There are 15 songs uh, that are called the Songs of Ascent, Psalms of Ascent. And they are songs that are written for the people of Israel as they make their journey, uh, their yearly pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem. And these songs act as soundtracks for the road trip. You know, soundtracks, we all have, uh, I know I have anyway, embedded in my cerebral cortex, certain songs and albums that have signified a road trip. I love finding albums, you know, a fresh new artist or album that I can just stick on uh, in the car and listen as I'm driving down the highway uh, towards my holiday destination. And when I hear some of those old albums now, they just take me straight back to that road trip, that holiday. Does anybody have that in their mind? You know, they've got albums for the road, songs and soundtracks for road trips. Well, listen, I, I do. I, I, you know, and, and I love thinking about finding new music when a holiday's coming up and sticking it on and going, yes, that is good. That's, that's the music I want to listen to. Uh, I used to look forward to that at least, But I've got four young children now, and so I don't necessarily get to choose the songs that I listen to. You know, to make a journey of any length bearable, then I don't choose. I've kind of got to let our kids choose the songs that we listen to. Just recently, the last Christmas holidays, we went on our family holidays down past Coffs Harbour. It was about a seven-hour drive uh, with our four young children, and I didn't get to choose the songs we were listening to. If I chose, then they would have screamed the car down, and uh, I would have gone insane, and so would have Megan. So we let them choose. Now, I would be very happy if they'd chosen, you know, Dan Warlow's greatest hits, you know, or even the Wiggles. You know, I'd be happy with the Wiggles. But they, uh, for some reason, we hadn't come across this song before, but this was the song, the soundtrack of our road trip. And uh, I, I don't know if you've heard this song before. It's called Baby Shark. I can't escape this song now. I was at the Big Bash the other day, and they played it at least twice, and it's got actions to it. Michael's got young kids. He, I walked in this morning. He was very excited that I was playing this song. He said, have you seen the actions? They've got actions, Andrew, to this song. Our kids were in the car doing actions. It was all very cute for the first two times, but after 1,000 times, Megan and I were going insane. It was nuts again and again and again. And I want to tell you, this is a dumb soundtrack for a road trip. Let me just give you three reasons why this is a dumb song for a road trip. Firstly, the tune just goes over and over and over again like a drill going through your head. I prefer to listen to a jackhammer, to be honest. Over and over again. Secondly, the lyrics are inane. They say absolutely nothing. Let me read to you some of the the lyrics. Baby shark, do 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 do. Grandma shark, do 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 do. Let's go hunt, do 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 do. It's the end. Do 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 do. They're the words. It's a dumb song. The third reason why this is a deeply inappropriate soundtrack for our road trip is because we're going to the beach and we're singing about sharks going on a hunt. This is a dumb song. But they love it. You know, now every time we get in the car, Jacob, our two-year-old, when he gets in his seat, something just triggers in his brain and he yells out, shark, 
shark, baby shark. And seriously, the other day I said, no shark. I'm sorry. I, I, I hate to tell you this, kids, but sadly, baby shark has been caught. <laughs> and he was served as flake with chips with a side of lemon. <laughs> Our kids now need counselling. You know, we need songs to help us for the road. You know, on road trips, songs help us, and we kind of needed Baby Shark uh, to kind of help us get to our destination. And the songs of ascent, the Psalms of ascent, help the people of Israel on their journey. They were songs that speak about the destination, the songs that speak about the why, they talk about the journey. They were songs that encouraged them. And they would sing these songs. 15 of them. And interestingly enough, uh, they, they come in little sections of three uh, with their own little narrative contained in them, five sets of three. And the psalm I'm going to read today that, that we're going to explore today is Psalm 122. It's the first of those three, and it speaks about the destination, but it sits within a little narrative, of Psalm 120, 121, and 122. They'd sing these songs as they make their way up to Jerusalem for the Feast of tabernacle to come and worship to their God. Psalm 120 in, the, in this little narrative talks about the origin of the journey. Psalm 120 verse 5 and 6 says this, Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I lived among those who hate peace. The sense of the origin of the journey, there is no peace. We're in a, in a place of disorder. We need to leave. And then Psalm 121 talks about the nature of the journey. It's a well-known psalm. Psalm 121, verse 1 says this, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. This very physical kind of uh, imagery. He will not let your foot slip on the journey. He who watches over you will not slumber. And then we get to Psalm 122, which speaks about the destination of the journey. If there's one thing I want you to take away uh, today, is that the vision of your destination will determine the direction of your journey. Your vision of the destination will determine the direction of your journey. And you may say to me, Andrew, that is so simple. That is so obvious. That is not a very good big idea. But in truth, when we start out on the journey so quickly and so easily, do we forget about the destination? We find ourselves distracted. We find ourselves discouraged. We find ourselves disoriented. We lose sight of the destination. And Psalm 122 acts as a reminder for the people of Israel on the journey of the destination. And I'm going to read it this morning. If you have your Bibles, feel free to open to Psalm 122. I'll also have the words on the screen behind me. Let's read this together. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, a, is built like a city that is closely compacted together. That is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statutes given to Israel. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Our vision of the destination determines the direction of our journey. As we read this psalm here, the very first verse, we see that our vision of the destination fills us with this sense of excitement, this joy and motivation. Verse 1 says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's go up to the temple. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to the temple to worship. There, there is a rejoicing here. There is a sense of excitement. 
And when we have a vision of the destination, it fills us with excitement. You know, I love preparing for road trips and holidays. You know, when I know I'm going on a journey, I, I'm, I'm there. I'm six months beforehand. I'm on Google Maps. I've got my travel guide. I'm mapping it out where we're going, where we're going to stop on the way, the different places we can go, the different detours that we can go, where we can kind of get lost and see different things. I love it. For six months, it fills my heart with joy. In fact, I think that preparing for a road trip is just as exciting as doing the road trip. Does anybody get excited about the preparing? Yeah, a bunch of you. That just fills my heart with joy in the preparation and the planning. It fills here, the psalm writer is, is filled with excitement. But our vision of the destination also fills us with great motivation. You know, I saw a very clear example of this just a few months ago. Megan and I had a, had a gap uh, in our schedule and we hadn't been to see her family who live in Florida for a number of years. So we decided to take our four young kids across to the other side of the planet to Florida to see our family, to see Megan's family. And so we packed all our luggage and all the car seats and then we took a very, very long flight in a tube, an air-conditioned tube, 18 and a half hours from Sydney to Dallas. That's a long time. That's a long time with kids. And, uh, and we, I remember our flight was delayed, and we had headwinds. I mean, it's already one of the longest commercial flights going, and it was just made longer. And because of our delay, when we arrived in Dallas, They'd changed our connecting flight because we'd missed our connecting flight, or so we thought. And so instead of going from Dallas to Florida, they'd sent us via North Carolina with four young kids. We were devastated. Well, we'd just done 18 and a half hours in the same air. We were angry. We were tired. We were ready to kill someone. And then we found out as we were given our redirected flights, we found out that our original flight to Florida was also delayed and we could get on it. So we ran to the gate and Megan said, let us on, we, we've got tickets, we can go. And they said, go away. You can't get on this flight. And then I saw something in Megan's eyes. <laughs> when I see it, I run. <laughs> and she ran. She ran straight to customer service. I was behind. I said, kids, you don't want to see what it's about to see. You don't want to hear. Let's just go and play over here. I have no idea what Megan said to the people at customer service there at Dallas Airport, but what I do know is we were on that flight to Florida. <laughs> yeah, I think she, I was, I was very glad as well. Thank you, sweetheart. She was motivated. Oh, there was the, the destination was in her heart and in her mind, and that's where we were going, and no one was getting in our way. And we got there. Our vision of the destination fills us with excitement, and it fills us with motivation, and that's just what the people of Israel needed. They needed a picture of their destination to excite them and motivate them. And Psalm 122 is a picture of the destination, it's a picture of Jerusalem the place that they would go to every year to worship and to sacrifice. And as we read this psalm here, we, we get a sense of what the des destination is. It paints this picture of why they should be excited, why they should be motivated. Firstly, it's, it's a city. It's a city. It's a place of people. People are all jammed in there, it says in verse 3. In verse 4, we read this. Jerusalem is the place where the tribes go up to, the tribes of the Lord. This is the place where people gather like any major city today. People go there to celebrate. They go there to party. They go there to enjoy life. They gather together. They go there to celebrate. In significant seasons, in significant times, that's the focal point. And Jerusalem was the focal point for the people of Israel. It was a place of people. It was also a place of praise. We read, as we continue in verse 4, they go up, the tribes go up to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. It's a place of praise. They're not just going to Jerusalem. They're going to the temple. They're going to the temple to worship. 
They're going to the temple to bring praise to their God. And they would go up once a year and make their yearly sacrifice, sacrifice an animal to receive forgiveness of their sins, to pay their dues, as was uh, stipulated in the Old Covenant. And so they would go up to the mountain. The temple was so, Jerusalem is so strong, still is in the psyche of the people of Israel. And the temple was so central to that, central to the place where God's presence was. The temple was the place where God came to meet with his people. They were going to the temple to be in the presence of God. It was a place of people, it was a place of praise. And thirdly, it was a place of power. Verse 5, there stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. This is the city of David, the great city of David, where the kings resided, where judgment was made, where government was made, where laws were executed. This was the place for Israel, the place of power. And in their minds, one day the Messiah would come and reign and rule in Jerusalem. It was the great place of power. And third, fourthly, it was the place of peace. Verse 7. In fact, most of the second half of, the, of this, uh, this psalm is dedicated to peace. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. Jerusalem was a symbol of peace. Like all cities in the ancient Near East, it would be a place where people would retreat to in times of attack. And people would go out and till the farms and the land, grow crops. But if there was an invading empire, they would run to the city and go through its gates, shut the gates and hide behind the powerful walls. Jerusalem had powerful walls. It was a place of security. It was a place of safety. It was a place of peace. Jerusalem was their ultimate destination. This was their great hope. This is where the Messiah would come. This is where the great king would reign from. It was so deeply ingrained, so powerful for the people of Israel. And so powerful that we, we get this sense in Psalm 122 that, that it transcends a location, almost. The location was deeply important, but it was kind of the, the destination, the vision of the destination kind of sat in their hearts. Because there were times in the story of Israel where they couldn't go to Jerusalem, where they couldn't make the pilgrimage and the journey, where they couldn't go to the temple to worship, to make sacrifices. For 70 years, during the Babylonian rule, the Babylonian exile, they were taken off to Babylon, and they couldn't make the journey to Jerusalem to sacrifice in the temple and worship. We get this sense in the Old Testament as they write, as they sit by the river Kabar in, in the Babylon and, and weep, because they can't go and be in Jerusalem. And throughout the history of Israel, that was their story. Back and forth, we see, we read in Nehemiah and Ezra that they do go back. Some go back, they rebuild the wall, they rebuild the temple, but the, the older folk who remember the great grand temple of Solomon weep. It's just, it's, it's, it's not what it was. If we map through history, read through history, we see that Herod, King Herod, builds this splendid temple that is ultimately again destroyed in AD 70. But it's this temple that, that Jesus walks through. He walks through Jerusalem and looks at the temple. He makes the same pilgrimage, the pilgrimage that people would have made for hundreds and hundreds of years. People carried this sense of Jerusalem in their heart. It's interesting that you get this sense of the now and the not yet in the psalm. In the NIV, as we read, verse 2 says, our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Our feet are standing. But that, that word standing, that verb, it, it, it's, it's a little bit confusing. It, it has multiple meanings. The ESV, English Standard Versions, are translated like this, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. And the King James Version translated, our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. There is this sense of the now and the not yet. They all work. It's kind of like we have been in your gates, Jerusalem. We are in your gates, Jerusalem. We will be in your gates, Jerusalem. 
In many ways, that adage, home is where the heart is, is very true for the people of Israel. Our vision of the destination has the power, as it did for the people of Israel, to transcend our current circumstances. Our vision of the destination has the power, as it was for the people of Israel, even when they weren't there, it was able to transcend their current circumstances. It sat in their heart. And they longed to worship in Jerusalem. We read in John chapter 2 that, that Jesus makes this journey. And he's in the temple and he's walking through Herod's temple. And he's walking through the courts at a time when many others have come to make that same journey. Maybe they've sung the, so the songs that are sent on the way. And they're in the courtyards coming to sacrifice. And Jesus walks around with despair and disgust. And we read in John chapter 2 that he makes himself a whip. And he begins to walk through the courts of the temple and he clears out the money changers and the, and the traders from the, from the outer courts, the, the courts of the Gentiles of the temple. Why? Because people are charging, the money changers and the sellers are charging exorbitant prices for the travelers and the pilgrims to buy animals to make their sacrifice. There is abuse going on. They are making it hard for people to worship. And Jesus is enraged. And he walks through and he clears out the temple courts. And the Jews come to him. And they say, with what authority can you do these things? How dare you come into the temple and clear us out? With what authority can you do this? And Jesus answers them in John chapter 2, verse 19. He says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. I mean, that must be, have been incredibly confusing. And they stood in the splendor of Herod's temple. Rebuild it in three days. But what Jesus is saying here, he's saying something incredibly profound. He's saying something incredibly prophetic. Although they couldn't understand it yet, and they would at one time, what he is saying is that I am changing the location of worship. He's saying worship will no longer take place in this temple. I'm changing the location of worship. No longer will worship take place in a certain part of a city at a certain time, but worship will be found in a person. And Jesus says prophetically, that person is me, the Son of God. And I'm sure many of you know the story of Jesus who came and walked the earth, ancient Judea, walked through the temple courts. You know the story that, that he lived, he did ministry, bringing in the kingdom of God, healing the sick, caring for the poor, teaching the poor and the rich alike, bringing a taste of heaven, the kingdom of God. He walked the earth. But because he made the claim to be the son of God, to be God, that was the accusation of the Jews. He was crucified on a cross, naked, bleeding. He was sacrificed. When Jesus says, I'm changing the location of the temple, he's saying, I am going to be that sacrifice. No longer will sacrifices need to be made for the atonement of sins. I will be that sacrifice once and for all. I will be the perfect sacrifice for every sin that every person ever commits and Jesus hangs naked and bleeding on a cross. And when he cries out, it is finished. That sacrifice has been made at that point in the temple. The, 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 the veil that separates the holy place from the holy of holies is torn in two. And the presence of God is open. No longer do we have to go to a certain place in a certain city at a certain time to worship we all at any time, at any place, are open and free to go and worship. That's the wonderful news of the gospel. 
that we have been forgiven. We have access to God. But Jesus just didn't die. He rose again, defeating sin and death. Death is defeated. It has no power anymore. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Death has been defeated by God himself. He has defeated death by rising again. And in doing so, when we find ourselves in him, this is the kicker. We are made new. We're a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And we're invited here as we sit here. We can say, let us go up to the house of the Lord. No, we can know the presence of God here and now. God is here amongst us now. His presence is here with us now, 24-7 now. The theologian, Tremper Longman III, I just like saying that name because it just sounds awesome. Tremper Longman III. He says this, if I can just find it, I've lost it. You got it on the screen there, let me read it. Since the coming of Christ, Christians know that God's holy presence permeates the world and there are no longer any specifically holy places. We can meet God anywhere. We can meet God anywhere. Jesus changes the location of our worship. It is now in a person. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. We can know his presence. We can know his power. But it's not just temporal. But it's forever. It's eternal. We get invited into something wonderful. There is this, there's this beautiful picture. And often we don't talk about eternity. Often we don't talk about the next life. Often we don't talk about heaven. But let me tell you that just as the people of Israel looked forward to the destination of Jerusalem, our destination has changed. Jesus has changed the destination. And our hope changes. We get this wonderful picture in Revelation chapter 21. Let me read this to you. May your hearts be inspired. As John has this vision of what is to come, and and Revelation is full of pictorial language, beautiful language. It's sometimes hard to understand, but be swept up in this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, coming down, a new Jerusalem, coming down. Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. Who is that bride? That's the church. It's the people of God who are in the presence of Jesus. It's us. Beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now where? It's among the people. And he will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. It's a picture of destination. Does that excite you people? Does it excite you? Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. We have this wrong vision of heaven where we're just kind of waiting until we die. And then we're going to go up into this place somewhere. It's a wrong vision. The vision of Revelation is this. We have already died. Those who are in Christ have put themselves to death. And they are invited into new creation. Death has lost its sting, people, for those who are in Christ. And Jesus is coming again, and he will make a new heaven and a new earth. But a little bit like us, he is making us new. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. You are a picture of what is to come, because he is making everything new. When we have a vision of the destination, it has the power to transcend our current circumstances. We look ahead, but there is something about now. Our vision of the destination doesn't just transcend our current circumstances. It has the power to transform right now, here and now, our current circumstances. 
We are invited into the eternal project now, today. We're invited in doing, in doing God's kingdom work today. The eternal has broken into the history of humanity, and we get a taste of it today. It is not just the not yet, it's also the now. Our vision of the destination has the power to transform our current situations. Or saying it in another way, our picture of tomorrow changes our practices today. Or another way of saying it, what we believe about tomorrow determines how we behave today. We are called to live with an eternal perspective because what we do now has eternal consequences. Does that make sense? So how we view our treasure, our money, our time, our gifts, our talents must be seen through the lens of eternity. And when we have an eternal vision, it sets us free from fear and anxiety. No longer do we have to live, you know, worried about tomorrow. No longer do we have to live for ourselves, sucking every moment out of this day and, and, the, and the rest of our uh, earthly life. But we are invited into a much greater story. We have a destination in our minds and our hearts that transforms tomorrow and in doing so transforms our today. This is radical, people. It sets us free from fear and liberates us to live a profound, eternally driven life that lives for legacy. We will see people, we will see our own lives in a radically different way if we have a true understanding of the destination. We'll have new purpose. We live life with new priorities. And we are invited, and this is how we are to see things, we are invited into God's great redemptive plan. We're invited into his great redemptive plan. Whatever we do now should be part of new creation, bringing the new. I love what the theologian N.T. Wright says about this. He says, every act of love, gratitude and kindness, every work of art or music inspired by the love of God and delight in the beauty of his creation, every minute spent teaching a severely handicapped child or, uh, or read, teaching them to read or to walk, every act of care and nurture, of comfort and support for one's fellow human beings, and for that matter, one's fellow non-human creatures, and of course, every prayer, all spirit-led teaching, every deed that spreads the gospel, builds up the church, embraces and embodies holiness rather than corruption, and makes the name of Jesus honored in the world, all of this will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. That is the logic of the mission of God, God's recreation of his wonderful world, which began with the resurrection of Jesus and continues mysteriously as God's people live in the risen Christ and in the power of his spirit, means that we do in Christ and by the spirit in the present is not wasted. What we do, it will last all the way into God's new world. Let me tell you that if you are in Christ, the eternal starts now. This world matters. Can I hear an amen? Come on, this should inspire you. You know, so often we get distracted. We lose sight of the eternal. We live in a world that is obsessed with the material. We are obsessed with material. We get so consumed with the things that we surround ourselves with, the house that we have, the car that we drive, the friends that we have, how our family's doing. We compare and contrast. It's not just us, it's the culture that we live in. We are a culture that is consumed with the material, this world. And with that comes great fear. And so we distract ourselves from even talking about and thinking about the future. Very rarely do we have conversations, I'm sure, at work or in your family about the next life or what's to come or what happens when we die. And there's a fear there, and that's why I think we are so consumed with the material, kind of trying to get everything out of this life. We, even as Christians, live like secularists at times. We don't live like we trust and believe and wrapped in the great resurrection story of God that death is already dead. A couple of months ago, I was 
uh, listening to a radio interview with a, an eye specialist who has been doing research in, uh, in emerging generations and eye care, and, and in particular, uh, Western, in the Western world with young people. And what they're finding is there's this insane amount of young people now who are suffering from myopia. I was listening to this interview going, wow, like, this is crazy. They, they were saying that in some parts of, of Asia, over 90% of young people are suffering from myopia. And I'm listening going, wow, this myopia is terrible. I was, I was sharing it with, with somebody a little bit later on. Yeah, did you know there's this thing called myopia? And, and over 90% of people, you know, young people in Asia have it. And he goes, mate, don't you wear glasses? I said, well, yeah. He said, well, you've got myopia, you idiot. So, oh, I didn't know that. Myopia is just short-sightedness or nearsightedness. Who's, who's myopic here today? Come on, let's just, bold kind of statement. All the, I don't know what you'd call us, myopioids? I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm wearing contact lenses today, people. And basically, this researcher was saying is that young people today are growing up in small, confined spaces and are spending most of their time looking at screens close to their face. And they're not using the lenses of their eyes and they're, and they're, they're not developing. The eyes are not properly developing and so that they are short-sighted like I am. If I was not wearing my contact lenses today, I would not be able to see any of you. I'm blind. I can only see what's in front of me here. And the reason for that, obviously, is they're spending time in front of screens and not exercising their eyes. And the researcher went on to say that the antidote to that is to get outside, to spend a couple of hours every day in the natural sunlight and looking down the road and looking, looking at, into the distance. And when you look into the distance, you are working your eyes properly. And I felt like God speak to me personally, and I felt like he was speaking to, to the church as well. He said to me, Andrew, don't become spiritually myopic. And I believe he would say to the church today, do not become spiritually myopic. Don't spend your life looking at the things that are immediately around you. Don't spend your world being just consumed with the pressures and the distractions and the anxieties that are there just in front of you. But get outside. Get out into the sunlight where you can see and you look down the road and look at the destination. Realize that I am king. Realize that, 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 that I am Lord. Andrew, Andrew, fix your eyes on me. Do not become spiritually myopic. And I wonder, even at the beginning of this new year, I, I reckon there are people here, a bunch of us here today, who right now, you know, as you think about 2018, you can't think about the year. You're overwhelmed with whatever's going on in your world right now. You've become spiritually myopic. There are, there are pressures, there are things going on in your life. And what's happened is you've lost your hope and you've lost your joy. And you're going around in circles and you're distracted and you're discouraged and you're disoriented because you've lost sight of the destination. You've forgotten that Jesus is Lord. You've forgotten that you're invited into a far greater story and that he is in control. And the things that we think are really, really important actually really, really aren't. And God wants to give you this morning a new perspective, a new lens a new vision. You know, even this last couple of weeks, Megs and I have been having to make some decisions and, and they're not really big in the grand scheme of things, but we felt like there's this anxiety and this pressure and God has spoken to us, said, lift your eyes, get a vision for me. What have I called you to? What have I invited you into? The great story of recreation. Maybe that's what you need to do today. You need to be reminded of the story that you're part of to lift your eyes and remind yourself of the destination. Our vision of the destination will determine the direction 
of your journey. In a minute, we're going to have some opportunity to pray for one another and bless one another and encourage one another on the journey at the beginning of this new year. But before we get there, I'd love to create an opportunity to make some space now for anybody here who, is not yet, who, who has not yet come into a relationship with Jesus. You've been sitting here, maybe this is your first time in church, maybe this is your first time in church for a long time, maybe you've decided to come back to church at the beginning of the new year, but, but if you're honest, you don't have that hope of the destination. You haven't made Jesus Lord, he isn't king of your life. If you were to die today, you, there is no certainty that you would enter into, that, into heaven, to the, to the offer that Jesus has. The eternal life that he offers of joy and peace. If you're honest that you are not walking that journey now, you are far from God, you, are, you don't have that certainty of peace, that certainty of hope, that certainty of your future. And as you sit here, you want it. And I'd love to invite you to make a profound statement today to surrender your life, to make Jesus king of your life and to enter into his great story that will last for eternity. This is an eternal moment for you. This is a choice for you right now to make Jesus king and to enter into the wonderful story. Now, I just invite you, we're not going to bow our head or close our eyes today, but if that's you, you're sitting here right now, you go, yes, I want to be in. I want to be part of this story. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to know Jesus. I want him to be king of my life. I want to live that story. Just where you are sitting right now, I'm going to invite you to do something brave. It's just to lift your hand high in the sky. We had a number of people at the 8 o'clock just make that transforming decision, life-changing decision. Decision. If that's you today, right now, just lift your hand up. Just across the place. It'll be brave. But this is a moment in eternity. Just lift your hand up high in the sky. Is there anyone here? Just lift your hand up. Come on. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Change your life. It will change the course of your eternity. This is an eternal moment. Just raise your hand where you are. Your heart might be beating. You're really nervous. It's a big decision, I understand. Just stick your hand up like this woman. Anybody else? High in the sky. Anyone else? I don't want to extend it out too much longer, but if it's you, come on, don't miss this opportunity. Anyone, just lift your hand up. Anyone else? Hey, that's okay. If you want to make that decision or you've got questions, please, please don't leave this place today with those questions. Come and see me afterwards. I'd love to chat with you. Hey, great that you are responded today. I'd love to invite you in a prayer that basically says, thank you for dying for me, God. Thank you for coming for me. Please forgive me and come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. And I'm going to lead that prayer. And if you are a Christian here today, we are all invited to pray that prayer of repentance and faith. Repenting and turning and, and turning towards. That's what this prayer is. Feel free to join with me as I, I lead this prayer. Why don't we bow our heads and close our eyes and just uh, say this after me, just out loud, above a whisper. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you came for me. I thank you that you died for me. I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've rejected you. I repent of my sin. Forgive me. God, come and fill me. Help me to follow you. Thank you that I am a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, why don't you just uh, celebrate this morning? So good. We hope you've been blessed by this message. We are a growing family and everybody who walks through our doors is welcome. If you'd like to connect with us, please head to gatewaybaptist.com.au to find out more.